Welcome to Casual Friday. So I have a finished object to show you. I want to talk a little bit about springtime in Minnesota and what that means for my knitting life. And then I want to talk a little bit about this week at the Knitters Guild and my knitting group and some things that came up for me that have caused me to reflect a little bit about why I knit. So I finished the mittens I was working on, the Chipman's Block Mittens. Now this one is, a, I haven't woven the ends in yet on this one. This is the first mitten that I knit. And I washed and blocked it to see how it would turn out. And then I knit the second one. And this one hasn't yet been washed and blocked. And it's a slightly, you know, it's interesting to just compare how the yarn looks, kind of how it mellows and softens when you wash and block it. And the sizing seems a little bit different and I'm curious to see if when I wash and block it and I shape it, if it will end up exactly the same or if somehow uh, I, I didn't quite knit things exactly the same. I do know I made a mistake on this that I didn't discover until it was almost nearly done with the hand and I ended up knitting an extra row in the body of the hand so that might have affected slightly the length but we'll see when they're done. But I really learned a lot from this particular project and from the books that I checked out from the textile center and then uh, one of those books I ended up buying um, as a result because I thought it was really worth um, having a book that talks so much about these traditions of folk mittens knit in the uh, state of Maine and then the maritime provinces of Canada. So yesterday was the, the first full day of spring. Spring began in the evening of March 20th, at least here in the United States. And it, things are warming up a little bit here. And it, but it's, it's interesting to me to think about what spring is here and what people think of when they think of spring because it's probably, even though we have a very long winter here and can get really cold and we can get sick of it, I think my least favorite season in Minnesota is spring. And I think it's because I don't really think of it as a season here. I think, I mean, I, wherever you live in whatever part of the United States or Canada or in Europe or Australia, where, whichever hemisphere you live in, when you think of spring, I'd be curious to, to hear what you actually think of. Because to me, when I imagine spring, I think of uh, green grass growing and trees budding and flowers uh, blooming and that sort of thing. And that doesn't really happen here in spring. Or if it does, it doesn't happen for a couple more months. So, so it's always kind of a disappointment to me to be having to endure this period of the year because I don't really think of it as a season so much as a transition from winter to summer. So a lot of you, especially if you live in more southern climates, are probably experiencing spring right now and you're probably loving it. The weather is probably beautiful and you you have flowers and bloom everywhere. And... Um, but then your summers are really kind of hot and miserable. And in Minnesota, our summers are beautiful. And they're probably a lot like what your spring weather is like. That's what we get here in the summer. This is the kind of place where people come to vacation in the summertime. Because we have so many lakes, we have forests, we have lots of rec outdoor recreational activities. We actually have a lot of outdoor recreational activities year round, including winter. Um, but but summertime is when it's, it's really fantastic here. So I went for a walk yesterday because it was so beautiful. We hit 50 degrees Fahrenheit yesterday. This is the first time it's been 50 degrees since November 1st. So it's been almost five months since we've had 50 degrees. <laughs> and so I took my dog for a walk. Now walking in the neighborhood has been pretty treacherous the past few weeks because um, as we've been getting a lot of melting because what's been happening is it freezes overnight 
and then and then we get up into the 30s and very low 40s during the daytime so we get a lot of melt during the day and then it freezes overnight and that means in the morning everything is ice and it can be really really difficult to get around when you're walking especially since I live in a hilly uh, neighborhood so the other the other big news here in, in Minneapolis is that they've lifted winter parking restrictions so if you live in a snowy climate there's probably times when you get enough snow where they where they have rules about not being able to park on, on streets or having to move your car so that the plows can get through and we have that in Minnesota but it was particularly difficult this year because of the amount of snow we got in February. Normally we get about eight inches of snow, a little less than eight inches of snow just in February. And this year we got 39 inches of snow. So about every three days we had another storm that dumped another five or six inches of snow and none of it was melting. And so, and because we live in the city, we have sidewalks in front of our homes and we are obligated to to clear those sidewalks within 24 hours of when the snow ends. And if there's a plowable amount, if there's three, four inches of snow at least, then they declare a snow emergency. And then we have all these rules about where you can park. And when you live in the city, again, it's not like the suburbs where everyone has a two car garage and a driveway and not that many people are parking in the street. Here in the city, we have more high density housing. And so we have a lot of apartment buildings, some of which were built a hundred years ago Go and there's no parking facility for that building so people have to park on the streets and in the neighborhood where I live in everybody has a garage but some of those are one car garages and they're in an alley and so people end up parking in the front of their home instead and especially if they have more than one car so what happens is we have this whole elaborate system of on the, the first day of the snow emergency you can't park on a snow emergency route at all between 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. and then the next morning is the second day of the snow emergency and you can park on the snow emergency routes again but you can't park on the even side of any row of any road that isn't a snow emergency route and then on the third day you can't park on the odd side of the street it's it's really confusing but there gets to be a point where the plows can't clear the snow all the way to the curbs because the snow has gotten piled so high that if they plow all the way to the curb the snow is going to end up dumping into the sidewalks which we have to keep clear so what they do is they is they plow just a little bit away from the curb and a little bit away from the curb and a little bit away from the curb so that they don't keep dumping snow in the sidewalks that we then have to try to put somewhere. And eventually what happens is that on the city streets, if people are parking on both sides of the road, an emergency vehicle, there's not enough room for a fire truck or an ambulance to get up the center. And so then they declare winter parking restrictions, which means that, uh, <laughs> When there isn't a snow emergency happening, so we, we're not in the middle of one of those three-day snow emergencies, when that's over, then you cannot park on the even side of the, of the street at all, unless it's a snow emergency route, in which case you can. It's, again, really confusing. So what that means is in these high-density areas where there's apartment buildings and there are already normally people parking every every spot they can find on both sides of the street that means that half of the parking is no longer available and it makes it really difficult to find places to park and even on places where you are allowed to park we were parking um, in an area of of the town called uptown we went to go to a restaurant and so first of all, we're parking like halfway into the lane. So the two lanes the available for traffic are not really available. And so we're parking there, but then the parking meter, it's like a, a pole. You're not plugging coins into it. It has a, a number on it. And then you have to go to a pay station. You couldn't even read the numbers. So the snow was piled up so high you could you could barely read it. And you were climbing over snow banks in order to, uh, to get places. So that was a real real pain in, in the butt. So today they lifted winter parking restrictions. Normally it goes till April 1st, but we've had enough melt that it's gone. We still have snow on the ground, but it's melted enough in the streets that we, we can once again drive everywhere uh, and park anywhere. 
course, that means that we're playing pothole slalom now in order <laughs> to get around all the potholes that develop with the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycle, but it is spring. So what happens for a lot of knitters in spring is that they're, they're looking outward. They're looking to spend more time outside. And in Minnesota, I'm not really spending any more time than I was outside before. I'm outside walking my dog and at the dog park. But it's not, I'm not gardening yet. There's, there's nothing to garden. Um, there's still snow. Once the snow is gone, we're still going to have a whole month where there's no grass. Um, there's no trees budding. There's uh, nothing, no yard work to do. So there's not really, it's going to be muddy and rainy and miserable. So we have winter and we have the thaw, we have April, and then we have spring. For me, my knitting activities don't change a whole lot, although I haven't produced very many uh, finished items lately. I think it's sort of a post finish it February time period, but I've also been writing and um, and doing some reading. So that's been cutting into my knitting time. It hasn't been because of outdoor activities though. But I'm curious about you and if you notice that your knitting falls off in the spring and the summer months or if you're pretty continuous all year long. Because I, I do knit year round but I do change from like I don't tend to knit sweaters um, so much in the summertime because all that wool on my lap gets a little too hot. But I'll continue to knit small projects in the summer because I want to keep my hands busy. So one of the things I like doing on Casual Fridays is sharing with you books that I've checked out from the textile library or sometimes they're books I just outright bought. And, and tell you a little bit about them. What I've noticed is that the books that I check out tend to be books that, I th that, that I'm thinking that I want. Like, oh, I want a book on such and such. I wonder if the Textile Center has that. And then I go and I check it out. Or I, somebody at Knitting Group shows me a book that um, looks interesting. And so I check it out of the Textile Center library to see what I think of it. And that's that's what happened with Robin Hansen's Mitten Books is that a friend at a knitting group lent it to me. I saw what it was. I got it from the library. Um, and then I ended up buying it in the end because I liked it so much. But I don't tend to just look for new things to see, well, I wonder what they have that's new and, and then investigate it. So I thought that I would start doing that because the Knitters Guild has a librarian who buys, her responsibility is, is acquiring new books for the Guild and putting in the library. And now we share our library at the Textile Center with all the guilds. So if you're a member of one guild, you can check out any book at the Textile Center Library. That's what makes it so great. It's the largest textile um, focused uh, library or collection of books in the country. And so it's a fantastic resource to have. And so at the meetings, the librarian will say, well, we just got these new books and she'll hold them up and say a little bit about it and they'll pass them around and, and you'll get it and you'll flip through it because you know, you're paying attention to the program or whatever. And it isn't something you're interested in knitting right now or you hadn't heard of it, or at least that's the case for me. And so I pass it on and, and I don't think about it again. So I thought, you know, it would be a really nice thing for me to actually look at the books that the Guild has purchased and take some of them home and really sit through and read through them and see what they are and then let you know what I think of them. So I went through before we had a guild meeting on Tuesday and I thought well I'm going to go look and see what we have bought recently and it was books that were bought maybe in the fall of last year because um, they get a new budget every year so she hadn't bought anything or presented anything to the guild yet this year. And so I looked to see what the most recent books were and I then I looked to see you know which ones of those were interesting to me and then did were they had anybody checked them out yet. So I found four books and my plan was I'm going to get to the to the uh, textile center early before the meeting and then I can check out those uh, four books because they keep the library open until seven when the meeting starts. They keep it open on, on nights that we have a guild meeting. So I left early and I drove to the textile center and they have several parking lots uh, that are devoted for guild members and then there's street parking. So I got there and the parking lot I usually park in was full. 
uh, the parking lot that I hardly ever park in um, was also full. And it was partially, some of those spots were taken up by snow that had been plowed because when they plow a parking lot, the snow has to go somewhere. So some of the spaces were taken up by that. And then it's really near the university campus. So there's a high density um, residences there. So apartment buildings and things like that. A lot of students live there. So a lot of people parking on the streets and in the streets that are very close to the textile center, it's parking by permit only in order to prevent people like us from parking there. And then the residents get home and they have no place to park. So I kept driving around, driving. I had to park, I think four or five blocks away. And then, you know, so it took me a while to find a place. I, I got in and then I had to walk four or five blocks to the textile center. By the time I got there, it was seven o'clock. The meeting was started and the library was closed. So I was a little disappointed and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to just come make a tri special trip back to the textile center. Well, part of the guild meeting, the business meeting is the librarian stood up and said, okay, I bought some new books for this year. These are the first books I've bought for the year. She had like 12, 12 different things to show us. And she's showing us these things and, and most of them was like, oh, you know, not interested, not interested. And then she held up a book and she said, and I'm gonna, cause I checked this book out. It was called Salt Water Mittens. And these are from the island of Newfoundland. So these are more mitten patterns from that area where I've been um, so interested in the past few weeks, only they're specifically only for Newfoundland. And the thing about Newfoundland is that it didn't even become part of Canada until I think after World War II. It's a really isolated, sort of a contained island of, to its own. So when people immigrated there from um, this, I think a southeastern coastal area of England and from Ireland, you know, a couple hundred years ago, those communities were there and they stayed there. And, and a lot of them still sound like they have Irish accents. So I, like, I watched this TV show called um, Murdoch Mysteries. It's Canadian and, and it takes place in the late Victorian and Edwardian era. So I was watching that a lot when I was knitting my Edwardian sweater. And one of the characters I thought maybe was supposed to be an Irish immigrant. And so I looked up the actor and it turns out he's from Newfoundland and his character is from Newfoundland. And I'm like, why does he sound Irish? And so I started looking into that. The authors of this book, Christine Legro and Shirley A. Scott, they have the same goals that Robin Hanson and Janetta I can't remember her last name, had in writing um, their books on mitten patterns from this area. And that was to preserve these traditions because these are mitten patterns that were just passed down for hundreds of years from one generation to another and they were never written down. They were just things that people learned. And so they were collecting these mittens and, and and, and examining them and, and um, figuring out what the stitch patterns were and creating mitten patterns for them. And what's interesting is that they, they indicated that these look like they're simple mitten patterns. They look like they'd be simple to knit, but they're not because of the way these stitch patterns interact. And that by examining these mittens that these women had, had knitted, or, and I assume some men uh, as well, they could see sort of the decisions that these knitters had to make about how to do certain shaping or how to do certain certain things. And sometimes you can see that they tried one thing and maybe tried another or, or maybe kind of made a mistake and just kept going with it. And so they made an effort to, to really write down what the traditional method was of working this, but also to say, here are some more modern techniques that work really well that make the appearance better, like how to do a jogless stripe or how to a transition when you're doing striping in a cuff, how to work, how to transition to a new color without getting those color blips. And so they have some new, more modern techniques that they employ, making it clear that these absolutely were, those particular techniques were not used in the originals, but since you're a modern knitter, 
maybe you would want to use those in your mittens. I thought it was a really interesting point to make. Like here are some improvements to techniques. Here, here's what they actually did. Because that was something I was struggling with as I was knitting my Edwardian sweater was, well, this isn't how I would do this today. And should I just knit it the way it says? Or should I knit it the way that I would want to knit it? Because a knitter back then might make certain decisions about how they wanted to make something. So there were times when I was knitting my Edwardian sweater where uh, I'm like, well, I'm going to be seaming this. I'm making a stockinette salvage stitch. I'm not going to work the pattern all the way to the edges like the pattern is written. Or it's calling for me to do this and I'm really going to do this other thing instead. But sometimes it's like a really unusual way of say working short rows that I just wonder how is that going to turn out? So I'm going to try it. So I, because I always feel like, well, if you're, if you're knitting a vintage pattern, how true to that pattern do I want to be? Like what is being true to that pattern versus um, just being a knitter born at the time I was born and wanting to make something from a pattern that was um, written a hundred and some years ago. I'll put some information down there about these mitten patterns. They include the stitch pattern that I was using on my mittens, but the Newfoundland mitten patterns do something a little bit different. They, they stop the patterning at the point, if it's gloves, like where the fingers would begin or where you might begin the decreases for the uh, mitten top, they stop this patterning and then they move it to the salt and pepper patterning, which is where you're alternating a light and dark um, one, just alternating back and forth. And they uh, often on the palms, they are working salt and pepper. So they're only doing this stitch pattern on the back of it. So that's a little different than what was happening in the in the other books that I've been looking at. Although those books did mention that that was something that some areas would do is they would just switch to a different stitch pattern when it was time to work the fingers or the tops of the mittens. But the other thing that they do is, so they use the same stitch pattern, but instead of always using like I've got dark blue and light blue, then they might do one repeat like that. And then the next time they might substitute a different dark color or a different light color. So you, so they start incorporating different um, colors throughout it and maybe three colors or sometimes four or five, you know, just switching things up. And it really makes an interesting difference in the appearance, like almost to the point where you don't recognize that it's the same stitch pattern unless you really look closely. So Wednesday mornings, uh, there's a weekly knitting group I've been going to since the fall. And so as we're all sitting there, there's, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a big group of people. There's a large table and this big group of people. And so you talk to the people next to you and, and then you hear what's going on across the table and people pass things around and you look at it and you find out more about them. And so there's, it's not one conversation going on. So sometimes you miss things or find out things and, um, but you end up talking to a lot of different people about a lot of different things. And one of the women, um, there was a lull in the conversation that I was having with the women right next to me. So I was knitting along and I heard her say, yeah, I would never pay $100 for a sweater, but I'll happily pay more than $100 for yarn to knit myself a sweater that might not fit me. <laughs> and it, which was kind of funny. And, and so I, and I said to her, well, that's because you're not, you're not buying yarn because you need a sweater. That's not why you're knitting a sweater. And so we were talking about like the reason that we knit and like what we get out of the process of knitting and how that isn't the purpose of the product. We might be really happy with what we ended up with or maybe not so happy with what we ended up with. But what the joy comes from is that process of, of working with the yarn and working through the pattern and how we're spending our time and how enjoy how many hours of enjoyment that we get from that. So this had me thinking about something that I've been thinking about, well, for years I've been thinking about this, but probably the past six, six months I've really been thinking about it now and then about how non-knitters don't really understand 
knitters. Like they don't really understand why we're doing what we're doing because they don't know what it feels like to pick out the pattern and pick out the yarn and to uh, have that tactile experience and, and uh, how interesting and engaging that that whole process can be for us. What they see is the thing that we end up with. And back when I was writing fiction, I would go to this uh, national conference once a year. And there were a lot of people from our local chapter who would go. And once, so one year, some, one of the women in the local chapter, she invited all of us uh, to her hotel room. So we're all sitting around chatting and I was knitting. I was knit, it was new to knitting socks and I was really um, happy and excited about self-striping yarns. I just love that. So I was knitting along. We're all ch chatting and somebody said to me, oh, what are, you, what are you knitting? And I held up my sock and said, oh, I'm knitting socks. And one of the women who I knew, but she wasn't a, she wasn't a friend of mine, but I knew her. And she said, well, you can get those at Walmart, you know. And, and I looked at what I was doing and I said, no, you can't. They don't sell hand knit socks made from hand painted yarn at Walmart. Because to me, it was like I wasn't knitting a pair of socks that I needed. <laughs> I, was, I was knitting a pair of socks and then I would get to wear them. But it was like, and I, and I just thought it was the weirdest thing for her to say because she was a creative person who spent hours of her time writing fiction in the hopes that maybe somebody would want to buy that book and then sell it. And if they ever did buy that book, it, was, it would be very unlikely she would make very much money. That's just the way fiction writing goes. There are very few people who make a lot of money off of it. So clearly, she was spending her creative energy doing something. And if she wanted a book, she could go buy one. She didn't need to write one. So it was, I, I just, it was just a weird conversation, but it really stuck in my head. And then a couple of years after that, I was at my hair salon and the woman who colored, I used to color my hair, uh, the woman who colored my hair was having a second baby. And so I made her a little toy stuffed animal, a little stuffed elephant for her new baby. And I, I um, handed her a little gift bag and she knew it was something that I had knit her because I'd knit her a number of things when she had her first baby. And so she's all excited and she pulls it out and she's like, you know, delighted with it. And she's so happy. She's showing it to everyone. Well, there was another woman at the salon, another customer who saw it and she said, you should sell those. And I said, no, you know, I don't sell my knitting. I sell patterns. I teach, you know, I teach knitting, you know, for money, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't sell my knitting. And usually that is enough <laughs> when somebody says that, you know, they're admiring what you've done and they're like, oh, you should sell those. And like, no, it's really, you know, it's just not worth it. But she was really persistent and she said, no, people would buy those. You should sell those. Like she was really insistent. So she was just so persistent that finally I said to her, okay, how much would you pay for this? And then she didn't know uh, what to say. You could see she hadn't thought about that before. She just saw this, this thing that she really liked. And she said, well, how much did the yarn cost? And I said, that's irrelevant. You don't know how much the materials cost for anything that you buy. If you saw this in a store, what would you pay for it? And she just couldn't, couldn't come up with any. She didn't want to say anything. And so I finally, I just said, well, it took me 15 hours to knit this. And she said, oh, okay, never mind. So in my mind, this, the woman at the hair salon, it was about, she's not a creative person. She's never made anything. So she just doesn't know how much time it is, it, ta it takes. And the writer was the one that I, that was completely mysterious. I didn't understand her reaction at all. But then I was having a discussion with a woman in the guild who's a friend of mine, and she used to sell uh, her knitting at craft fairs. And she said what she had finally realized over the years and from talking to even people in her family who were not knitters is that they 
they do not see the process or the reason why you're knitting. What they see is a product. And what you have knit is a product. And they are looking at it in terms of whether or not they want to have it and how much they would pay for it. They are not looking at it in terms of how much labor went into it or the cost of materials. That's just not, they're, they're doing a comparison with what they can buy elsewhere. And suddenly it all became clear to me that these two women were very similar in that regard. The writer actually did have a sense of how long it was taking me to knit that sock. But what she saw that I was doing was knitting a sock. And that if I wanted socks, I could get them really easily, like for, and for no money and no time. Like why would I spend my time making socks when I could just buy them? And in her mind, she might be thinking, why would you do that? Why would you spend your time knitting a sock when you could be spending your time writing? I mean, I don't know, but it just gave me a different way of looking at that. And the woman at the hair salon saw an item that she thought was adorable. She saw a product. And, and when she sees a product, you know, a lot of people see a product, what they think is if there is a product, you should be wanting to sell that. If you are producing a product, it should be for sale. So therefore you should sell these things. It's completely eliminating the whole reason why I'm creating this. And the reason I'm creating it is not in order really to have this end product. It's to spend my time doing something I find enjoyable for somebody that I care about. Like there's so much involved in presenting a knitted item to somebody because it represents your relationship to them. It represents how much time you're willing to spend on them, um, how much you love them. It's like all of this um, that goes into that, that has nothing to do with how much that costs if you, it would cost if you saw it in a store somewhere. But it gave me a really different perspective on how to respond to those sorts of comments and how I could frame the discussion that comes out of that a little bit differently based on that and to talk to those people about this is not a product. <laughs> this is a process. This, this represents the result of a process and it's the process that's important to me. And if you try to put um, a dollar amount on that, that's when it all falls apart for me is that I'm not doing this for money. So if you're trying to offer me money for it, then it completely destroys why I'm participating in this process. So that's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I'm not saying that, that no one should sell their knitting and that people are wrong to sell their knitting. It's not it at all. I know that some knitters just really enjoy knitting and they can't use the things that they like to knit. And so they sell them for the cost of the yarn so they can buy more yarn that allows them to knit. Some people actually do try to knit things that are going to produce some sort of profit for them in some way. But it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult thing to do. And it's something that I have chosen not to do. But I, ha I don't think I've done a good job of communicating that in the past because I didn't understand their position. So there's no way for them to understand mine. I can't articulate my position if I don't understand theirs. Anyway, it's given me another way to talk about this. I'd be curious to hear how you guys have explained why you knit to people who are not knitters. I think it's easier to explain it to other creative people, people who produce things that are labor intensive and and um, do and do it for the joy of it. But I would be really interested to see how you respond um, to those sorts of comments. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.